happened. Uh, this is something that Hilgard and Hilgard did at Stanford, and they found it by accident. They were doing a lot of tests on pain and a bunch of things, and they were giving a presentation and a demonstration, and they brought a guy up from the audience who happened to be blind, and there's not a whole lot that's interesting about that other than trivia, but they had him come up as a test subject. And what they were doing was showing negative hallucination. And instead of doing it with pain, they did it with sound. They said, this is a guy who's blind, so obviously the sense of sound is very important to him. So they put him in the chair and they set something up, you know, you're not going to hear anything. Once I touch the back of your hand, you'll be able to hear again. Some mechanism like that. Put him in the chair, didn't tell him what they were going to do. Took two blocks of wood and slammed them together right by the guy's ear. And he didn't flinch. So they went to the other side, slammed them together, didn't flinch. And everybody in the audience was obviously impressed. So he started taking a couple questions and left the guy there for a couple minutes because they were so caught up in this excitement. And they talked about a few things and they asked a couple questions and he explained what he could. And then they brought the guy out of hypnosis and they asked him, what happened? He said, told me I couldn't hear anything. I sat there for a while and didn't hear anything. And he touched my hand and now I'm back. They said, do you remember hearing anything? And he said, no. A student raised their hand and said, if you hypnotized him again, would he remember it? And Ernest Hogarth said, I have no idea. And so they hypnotized him. And they brought him down to the same level he was at. And they said, what happened? And he said, you banged some blocks together here. You banged some wood together here. A girl somewhere around there asked a question. And somebody over here asked a question. And you said this and that. And remembered all of it perfectly. This is a really, really neat thing. They did more studies on it. And they found a whole lot of things. An interesting thing, they did objective studies on what they called covert pain in the hidden observer. Even when the person had no conscious recollection of any discomfort, there was a piece of them that was always monitoring and recording it. And when they you know, reinduced hypnosis and asked questions of the hidden observer and that covert pain, the covert pain matched the control groups, which means it's objectively accurate within reason for humanity and sensation. So we all know when you're hypnotized, you're always aware. It's not a loss of awareness. But even when you're anesthetized completely to the point where you could do complete surgery, your body and mind are still recording your existence and your life. That's a neat thing. That's a really fun thing. And actually, I use that in my office. I use that knowledge not only for working for pain clients. I use that when I'm working for change work. When I'm doing something with somebody for, let's take something as arbitrary as biting their nails very benign. I'll hypnotize somebody to a depth that most people say, oh, that's too deep. You're not going to get results. And we're going to actually do Esdale in a couple minutes. Um, you know, people who get afraid of the coma state and, oh, you can't get change work done there because it's too deep. But I understand the covert pain and the hidden observer is always there and always listening. And at an even more comfortable level than they're at during normal hypnosis, they're still paying attention. They're not motivated to make dramatic movements or change or convince you that they're hypnotized but they're still responsive. They're still aware. And so I'll use the hidden observer all the time in my office. I love it. In fact, I used it twice yesterday. Um, yeah, it's a great thing. So that's, I just want to talk about that. And actually, let's back up a page and talk about something that's important. And that's classic pain control theories. <laughs> I said that as if the other stuff isn't important, didn't I? <laughs> um, thanks for that. Um, Classic pain control theories are really important for a couple reasons. One, it allows you to communicate intelligently with medical professionals who know this stuff. The other thing it's done for me is let me know how to create new techniques. Once I understand mechanistically what's going on with pain, I can understand how to work around it, how to beat the system. So let's just start. I mean, these are in chronological order, and these are far from all of them, but these are some of the good ones that makes sense for me. The first one is specificity theory. Very simply put, think of it like your eye. Your eye has rods and cones, basically receptors for light and color. Cones do color, rods do light. Rods don't do color, right? Very specific. Specificity theory says there's, sensa there's nerves and receptors for warmth, for touch, for pressure, for pinching. Different sensations have different receptors. That was specificity theory which is not an easy thing to say. Um, and they came up with that. Kind of neat. And then they moved on. Gate control theory is the one that I really want to talk about. 
gate control theory is the one that's kind of the standard classic pain control theory that's still used today. And even new theories are based on gate control theory. It's the most widely accepted and it's most widely popular from what I know. And that's the one that came up with sensation versus suffering. That's the one that looked at the different parts of the brain and saw that there were different things happening. They were also the ones that came up with the idea of concurrent stimulation. Concurrent stimulation is the stints and the stems, the, you know, the nerve stimulators, those things. Basically, it's stuff that they use for pain control where they just sort of eat up the bandwidth of your neurology. You know, think of it, think of it like the internet, really. You know, you've got the traffic. I think of it like a freeway. That would probably be easier. Um, I guess I'm a nerd. Great. Um, <laughs> think of it like traffic. You've got a freeway moving towards your brain. All they're going to do is fill that up with it, just something neutral so that the signal doesn't get there in the same intensity or at all. The neat thing about concurrent stimulation is that the reduction in discomfort and the, the improved quality of life outlasts the counter irritant. So you're at a pain level of, say, six. I hook you up to this machine. We do this thing that brings it down to a two. Take you off the machine, you walk out of the office, and you stay at a two for a while. That's the idea of concurrent stimulation. And there's actually a couple techniques that I've developed based on that alone. One that we're going to be doing tomorrow, and one that we're just going to talk about because it's just weird. And it's the one that I did for the dentist's office the other day that I don't know how to teach yet. So we're just going to talk about it and play around with it. And if we have time, we will break up into groups and do it. But it's an interesting thing. It's really simple. 